Hey friends, today on Active Self Protection Extra, I want to talk to you about some of the criticism or the, the people who are wondering if the video that I did here on the Extra channel on the marksmanship standards of the recent church shootings in White Settlement, Texas at the West Freeway Church of Christ were accurate or good or helpful. I had a couple of criticisms of the, the what I did that day, and so I want to talk about those with you and see if they are valid and give you some of the reasons why I did what I did. Okay, well, first of all, let me say that I am totally down with people going, John, what about this? How does that go? Whatever. That's totally fine. Uh, even people who say, John, I don't think you did a very good job of that. That's totally cool with me. I get it. We're going to have differences of opinion on some things. Uh, I mean, some of them were unkind, but people on YouTube are jerks. And so that just is what it is. Uh, but a couple things. The first thing that uh, people said was, yeah, John, well, you said you had these marksmanship standards, but these guys uh, weren't expecting it and they weren't, you know, uh, there. So you're expecting expecting a beep, that makes you faster, and they weren't expecting a problem. And that itself is a problem, okay? So that particular criticism is completely invalid, particularly in the case of the shootings at West Freeway Church of Christ. And I'll tell you why. They knew this guy was a problem coming in the door. They knew for a fact he was wearing a wig and a beard, and he had had problems with the pastoral staff being angry at them when they wouldn't give him money. They had a security camera that was completely just focused on him, and they had the security guy, unfortunately he was the first guy who died, who was sitting in the back row who was tasked to keep an eye on him. So they're totally clued on this guy, and when this guy in the middle of communion got up to go and start yelling at one of the communion ushers or confront him, that was an absolute signal. So. In all of this particular incident, if you have all those things, one of the things that we talk about with church safety when I teach church safety is knowing the pre-attack indicators and knowing when you have to be ready to ramp things up. Now, that takes a mindset, you guys. That takes the mindset that says, here's this picture of a man who I have in my congregation who doesn't fit in here. He's not here kind of doing the right things. He's gotten up before. He's caused problems with my pastoral staff before. He's wearing a long coat. I can't see inside there. He's wearing a fake wig and a fake beard, and I know all those things. So even if I let him in my congregation to worship that day, which I get it, you want your church to be open, welcoming, and inviting, you either have to buddy up with him one-on-one, -on -one, super close, never him never leaving your side, and you say, he gets up, I get up. He moves, I move. And if he puts anything in his hands, I'm grabbing those hands, and we're going to tussle over it. I think that would have been an acceptable and even a good answer in this case. However, if you don't do that, and you go, no, I'm going to give him a little space to give me a a little space, whatever, you have to have the mindset that says, but I'm watching his hands. And the second I see something in his hands that is a threat, I'm going to have a gun out on that guy and make sure that threat doesn't hurt anybody. And, and again, anybody pulling a shotgun out in church is not playing show and tell. They're not, you know, pulling a shotgun out to show you how cool their shotgun is in the middle of communion. They're going to kill people that with absolute certainty. So again, they absolutely, from a mindset perspective, should have been ready and keyed in on this guy and knowing if that guy puts anything dangerous in his hands, if he comes out with a gun, if he comes out with a knife, if he comes out with a baseball bat, I'm going to absolutely fill him in without even thinking about it. I'm getting a gun in my hand and going to work. So that criticism personally that says, well, yeah, but you were ready and they weren't, so they're going to be slower is bupkis. Secondly, on my main channel video of that, I actually timed their draw to first shot from the time that they started going for their gun. Technically, I backed it up a quarter second from there. So we know when you make a decision and go, oh, I need to draw a gun, it takes your brain about a quarter of a second to then make that happen at the hands level for you to start moving. When you make a decision, I'm gonna go and, and do this thing, it takes your brain a half a second to code that message and send it through your neurons and get your muscles moving. So I moved, moved my timer from the first time when they just started moving, when they went, oh no, I gotta go get a gun. I backed up a quarter second from there and that's where I timed their draws to first shot. Again, the poor man who passed away, uh, he had 3.1 seconds from that moment until the shot that took his life happened. Jack Wilson, from the time he started going for his gun, he had about six seconds at 15 yards. Okay, second one that uh, people have given me a hard time about is they've said, yeah, but John, you're using a red dot sight and Jack was using an iron sighted pistol, so you should shoot that with irons. And my answer to that is no, that's stupid. This is my everyday carry gun. I'll lock it open so you can see that it's empty. Uh, it's actually set up for dry fire right now. Still going to treat it like a live pistol, not going to point it at myself. But uh, this is my everyday carry gun. This is Benvolio, my HKP30 Lem gray guns. So 
cool. I love the limb trigger. I love a gray guns trigger job on this and it's got an RMR on it. In fact, it doesn't even have backup iron sights on it. Lost my front sight back in February off this gun, shot it into the berm and haven't needed it. Um, and, and this is my everyday carry gun. So I shot that shot. I shot that test with my everyday carry gun. This is the gun that I carry in church. This is the gun that I carry in my everyday life. So I shot with this gun. Jack, of course, shot with his everyday carry gun. You should shoot that marksmanship standard with your everyday carry gun. And if your everyday carry gun has irons, you should use irons. But for me to shoot this with a red dot is absolutely not cheating, other than the fact that I carry this cheater gun every single day. Shoot it with your everyday carry gun. Third criticism has just a little bit of uh, viability to it that says, well, um, on the longer range shot, you know, uh, the target's not moving. Jack's target was moving from his left to his right, and that makes it a harder shot. I I'm gonna agree with you on that one. I mean, there's really nothing that I could do in the setting where I was on a static range that I could make that target move from left to right with any degree of, of certainty of doing it. I don't have one of those, you know, little tank tracks, movable target kind of things, dummy rubber dummies. I just don't have it. So I, it was the best job that I could do of approximating that shot. Certainly, if you can't do it stationary, you can't do it moving. So do it stationary first a few times. See if you can make that hit. Train until you can make that hit on the reg. Then start to worry about moving things from a, you know, a, a horizontal perspective. I just couldn't do it out on the range. So that's just an artificiality of, uh, of range life and nothing I'm going to do about that. Another complaint or challenge that we saw in the video is a few people saying, well, but John, you are standing on the range and the time included the man who passed away uh, standing up and drawing his pistol. And so you shouldn't do that. You should do it from seated position and see how long it takes you to uh, stand up and do that. Well, again, quite frankly, this is why I carry the way that I do because it wouldn't make it any longer for me from this seated position than it would uh, elsewise. Why? I carry appendix. I carry the gun in the appendix position. And guess what? Appendix is built to be working in this space where I am. So me, whether I'm sitting down or standing up, I basically have have the same draw stroke here without any adjustments whatsoever. Now there is a difference. I'm going to slide over here so you can see. So, so our, our uh, you know first victim was sitting again with his back on his uh, uh, pew, right? So he's sitting on the back pew and he's sitting all the way back. Now he was carrying all the way in the small of his back. I don't recommend smaller back carry. I don't think smaller back carry is an effective way to carry a firearm because what that made him do is he went, oh no, I gotta go get a gun. I have to clear my entire garment. He was wearing a suit coat because he's Church of Christ and those folks tend to get dressed up for church. And so his mindset to do that is, okay, now I gotta stand up, clear all this, get a gun out of the small of the back, get that gun out in the fight and go to work. Why? Because his gun is being covered by the chair, by the chair back, uh, the pew back where he is. So yes, he had to do that. If you're carrying strong side, so I'm left-handed, so I'm showing you this on the left side. The challenge you're gonna find is, is that you don't necessarily have to get all the way up, but you do need to move forward because when I go to draw a gun, I got two choices. Either I go, oh no, I gotta get this gun off the side, and what I do is I chicken wing out like crazy like this. So I gotta go, oh no, and go and draw, and then I, I tend to kind of hunch over the side here. Or what I tend to do is if I try to just come straight back like I'd normally teach somebody while they're standing, I can't do that, my, my elbow runs into the back of the chair. So what I do is I lean forward so that I clear some space there to get my hand on the gun, go off and go to work. However, what I say all the time, and this is, I, you know, again, I just sat down. I didn't really do anything special. I'll do it for you as well. This is kind of how I do everything as everything sets up my normal carry method here of an appendix carried gun. And what do I do? I just sit down. That's all I do. Now I will kind of fluff like blouse here, my polo shirt, but this is exactly how I went to church this weekend. And so this is what I do. Now, what do I do in an appendix carry rig, which is one of the reasons that I really like appendix carry, is if I'm in this spot, now again, I'm gonna give you two options here. And at three yards, I have somebody that I know could be a problem. Now, I might, you know, I am absolutely a cheater in these ways because these things happen. So I could sit here with my hands on my, my thighs, and if I did that in that case, I would grab a fistful here at my belly, lift my cover garment, get my gun, and go to work. Or what I am much more apt to do is sit here and just, you know, with my hands folded in my lap. And when I have that hands folded in my lap and I'm keyed on this 
this guy because of the mindset piece that says, man, if that guy fills his hand, I'm going to have to fill him in. And so if, if he puts a gun in his hand, he gets anything out of his pockets that I don't, you know, am not excited about, I'm going to get after him really fast. I will clue this. Now I'm going to tell you, if you want to do that even more, one of the things that if you really think there could be a problem and that guy pops up or whatever, but you don't want to quite draw a gun yet, you can, specifically if you're carrying appendix, you can cheat your hand to the gun. Now one of the things that you're going to notice here that me in doing that, I'm going to clear everything and set down on this and that would take me some time to do. But if I'm sitting here like this, notice this for regular people, if I'm covered over like this, this does not look threatening unless he's keying on me personally. This does not look threatening, but I can get the gun out very, very fast from here, like ridiculously fast. And even if I don't and I go, you know what, I'm not going to get my hand on my gun, I'm going to hold here. This looks almost identical to me standing in my, my fig leaf position that I like to draw the gun from. So I put the gun back where it was. Once again, I don't futz around with things like crazy. I just sit my butt down. I will blouse my shirt so that it's kind of in an easier position and sit just like this all day, every day. Now then, I can't really show you this because it doesn't come out on camera very well, but I know somebody's gonna say, yeah, but John, you're pointing a gun at your junk. We've talked about that ad nauseum infinitum. I have a proper wedge on this holster. I can reach down right here and point right exactly to where the muzzle of my holster is, and it would maybe, maybe a tiny bit crease one edge and get you know, a little bit in my fat bits in my thigh, but if, God forbid, I had a negligent discharge there, it wouldn't hurt me, and I'm gonna get that gun out and move it anyways. So uh, I haven't been practicing today, but I wanna see, okay, so wait a minute, I got my pocket pro timer here that I need to turn on and uh, I want to see, oh okay, set up to a random beep. Now this particular chair has some uh, armrests on it. So the pew that our, our first victim was in did not have those, but I'm going to show that this is kind of the hardest way. This is like kind of pro mode that I can't even and push my elbows out a little bit as an appendix carrier. But if I am here and things, and especially again, if I am clued on somebody and I go, okay, wait a minute, I want to make sure that my garments are right and everything's right and I'm in a good spot, but do I have to get up and am I significantly slower? Well, you know my standard, well, I'm in dry fire right now, my standard of a draw to first shot is a 1.0 draw to first shot at seven yards. I'd say at three yards that would tend to be faster because I don't have to have as refined a sight picture. I have my part timer set up here for one second, Let's see what we get. That was right on it, you can hear the click and the beep. Right on one second, so it didn't change anything. Let's try it again. Uh, not a great grip on the gun on that time. You probably saw that. Uh, I was on the part time, but not a great grip on the gun. Let's see if I can get a better grip on the gun this time. No, I was ahead of the beep there. That was good. Um, and again, I got to kind of chicken wing this out a little bit because of these seats. I can't get my keep my elbows anchored like I like because of these. And so it takes me a tiny bit longer. Let's try this with a, a chair that doesn't have the sides on it. Okay, I'm set up with a chair where I don't have kind of the sides now. This is just a st stool, you know, that my kids use to uh, do artwork and stuff. Let's see what, if that makes any difference. Yeah, I'm significantly ahead there. Saw everything that I needed to see. Gotta safely put the gun away again. The, the, the muzzle is just outside where my guts are and stuff, so I do tend to lean back a little bit just for a little added safety. Let's try it again. Definitely ahead of the 1.0 shot there. So, so again, an advantage of appendix carry. Now, if I am carrying strong side, I can't just whip this cover garment aside or I can't just lift here. I got to think about this elbow again. It probably make me a little bit slower, but I don't have to completely stand up. The only time I have to completely stand up is if I'm small at the back. So that criticism, I don't think is super valid because for me, if I wasn't buddy buddy on him, if I wasn't choosing to be right up on him and I'm going to stay a couple yards away from him or whatever, I'm carrying in my regular appendix carry place and I can still get the gun out when I've keyed on him and burn him down pretty quick. I think another one that people came up with uh, and got frustrated with is the fact that, you know, being on a range, I, I don't have the same stress level as a real life gunfight. Um, you're right. I, 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 unfortunately for things to practice in the range, I can't uh, get out on the, the in having real gunfights to show you that on camera. That's just not possible. So you're right. It's not as stressful. I'm not saying it was as stressful. I'm saying if you can't do it on the range when you're not under that kind of stress, you're not going to be able to do it in real life. So if you can do it on the range, it doesn't necessarily mean you can do it in real life. But if you can't, we know you can't. So at least you get it to where you can do it there and that gives you a better chance in real life. Make sense? Part of that discussion too was somebody saying, we well, yeah, John, but, but it's not the same if you have the gun pointed at you. 
technically. Uh, and again, uh, Jack Wilson is a hero, saved a lot of lives that day. Um, but let's not make him of mythical proportions, right? Let's make sure that we keep the story what it was. The gun actually wasn't pointed at him. He got shot two people in the congregation, then turned to go towards the front of the sanctuary, where I'm sure he was going to wreak more havoc. So the gun was pointed away from Jack when he got his gun out and did his work. So uh, when somebody is pointing guns at people you love, that's a serious issue as well. I, I, I don't think that's really less stressful than it pointed at you, but let's make sure that if you have that criticism, that it is about what things that really happen, not things that didn't happen. Pretty please. So there are more things to talk about, about uh, West Freeway Church of Christ and things that we can learn and lessons we can learn. That's not this video. What I really wanted to do though is talk about, well, wait a minute, are we really in a place where, well, I had to stand up in order to shoot? Nope, not if you carry appendix. Um, and that's one of the reasons that I do in a good belt, good holster, those kinds of things and, and make all that right so that I can just get the gun out from right where I'm at. Um, the marksmanship standard thing, I mean, uh, if you go watch the video, I missed the first headshot. I missed it high. So there it is. I sucked that day. Um, I'd have taken another shot if he was still up and that's what that was, right? So make sure that you understand what those look like and what those marksmanship standards are. Some of the other discussions, eh, I don't think they're a great critique. And some of the reasons that we do what we do in trying to recreate those things, once again, is certainly not to cast any aspersions on the people who were there that day. They had what they had, but let's learn the lessons to train ourselves to a high standard that God forbid we get put in a similar situation, then we have the a requisite skill level to come out of it successfully. I hope that's the lesson that you got. And let's think about as we watch those videos and as we see what goes on on the main channel, what the real critiques and the real lessons are. And the last one again, when we go back to, well, wait a minute, John, you, you cheat. Yeah, I carry a cheater gun every day and I carry that cheater gun for a reason and I work with that cheater gun a lot and I would strongly encourage you one last thing about at church whatever gun you carry that's the gun you got to practice with so make sure that you uh, maybe aren't carrying the little LCP but carry the big gun carry the cheater gun to church because you might need it